Welcome back to the Defining Beauty series. This week we're looking at the importance of the eye area and how it influences your look. For those of you that are new to the series, we take a look at the science behind facial attractiveness and how certain features come together to create harmony. I do apologize, I'm a bit sick this week so I'm gonna sound kinda more nasally than usual. I don't know. <laughs> Before we begin, I'd like to put out the disclaimer that, as always, I'm not trying to single anyone out or to pick on anyone's looks. This series is all about taking an unbiased look at what creates facial harmony, aka the study of physiognomy. In the last video, I opened with a scientific paper on the influence of facial components in determining attractiveness. From what I gathered in the comments, the majority of you chose A or C as expected from the experiment's own results. B was determined less attractive because it had a greater interpupillary width between the two eyes. This led us to our first aspect of a good eye area, how far apart are the eyes. If you've ever taken an art anatomy class, you might be aware that ideally human eyes should be one eye width apart. Here's an article written about a 2008 experiment on specifically interpupillary distance between the eyes and how that influences attractiveness. To summarize it for you, there's a certain set of ratios between eye width and vertical distance from the mouth your eyes must be within to be considered attractive. Faces were judged as most attractive when the distance between the eyes were 46% of the face's width and the vertical distance from the mouth was 36% of the face's length. Ultimately, this correlates with what we know as the golden ratio. Here's a really interesting article on the topic in the description. Moving on, the eye shape is significantly important in identifying faces. It's why we censor only the eye region to maintain privacy in photos. This is because this region of your face contains the most detail about you, from tiny fine wrinkles like crow's feet that indicate that you like to laugh open mouth a lot, to larger identifiers such as your eye shape. Without these tools, our brain can't subconsciously fill in the details and the subject remains anonymous. Do you know who this model is? You probably can't tell with the mid face and eyes covered. With the thin bar over the eyes, you still can't tell unless you've seen this picture before of course. Once we reveal the eyes, it's pretty clear that it's Kay Upton. No amount of hiding her nose or her mouth is going to change that. By hiding only the eyes and not even the entire region, we can obfuscate someone's identity. That's how important your eyes are to attractiveness. I would rate it second only to the jaw, as I'll explain in a bit. Now, I teased this photo of Tom Cruise earlier this week. Before you learn the terminology, try to think to yourself what's changed between the two photos and if you find one more attractive than the other. Tell me in the comments. Let's start with the easy ones. His eyebrows are a fairer colour. In men, dark eyebrows are preferred because they subconsciously indicate youth and virility, the same way male pattern balding can make you drop a few points if you don't have the face to match. His eye colour is different. A 10 second Google will tell you that lighter colours such as blue and green are considered more attractive, likely due to Eurocentric beauty standards, but I think that's a very minor issue compared to the bigger ones. Bigger issue would be his scleral show. These are your sclera, it's a white around your eyes. Ideally, you want the skin around your eyes to hide the sclera below your iris, otherwise you end up looking tired. The majority of people have scleral show and almond shapes like Tom Cruise's eyes are very rare and typically found in caucasoid skull shapes because they have a more prominent brow bone. In humans, there are four predominant skull shapes which influence your final phenotype and I'll cover this in a future video. Scleral show isn't a deal breaker because the majority of us have it, but many elect to get a canthoplasty to achieve the almond eye look, which involves putting a piece of plastic under the tendon that holds your lower eyelid and raising the entire structure. In doing so, there's less of a depression in your skin and so there's a smoother curve from cheek to eye. Notice that on the right, more of his eyes are exposed. They essentially look larger because his brow bone has been raised in the edit. It completely changes the look and makes him seem more bug-eyed rather than deep-set and mysterious because anatomically they'd have to be pushed further out due to less orbital bone support. In anatomy, the orbital bones are the socket bones that encase your eye. Smaller orbital sockets like Tom's actual face produce wider, more desirable eye shapes than larger orbital sockets, which again are influenced by skull type. More prominent Neanderthal-like features like brow bones, I know Tom isn't a Neanderthal, but they indicate higher testosterone in the womb and have been linked to more dominant, assertive personalities upon maturation. The size of your eye area also influences your facial harmony. If you have a long face, then your eyes, as in the entire structure and not just the eyeball, need to be physically larger, ideally both vertically and horizontally, to stay in proportion. This example covers the same points as Tom's, except for two details his image didn't have. 
Notice how the upper eyelid covers more of the eyeball on the left image than the one on the right, which exposes its entire eye. Upper eyelid exposure is a feature formed from either fat stored above the eye or from a prominent brow ridge. As more of the brow spills over the eyes, the amount of eyelid exposed reduces. Upper eyelid exposure is undesirable because it makes you seem tired and gives the impression of more protruding eyes, aka bug eyes. Eyelid exposed however changes throughout the day for most people. Take a picture of yourself right after waking up and compare it with one taken during the midday. The image on the left also has a negative canthal tilt, which as I explained in episode 1 of the series, makes your face seem saggy and tired. The image on the right has a positive canthal tilt, which is in harmony with his face as all of his features angle downwards and towards a V taper. Now that I've covered all of these features that make up the eye region, I want to emphasize that not all of these can be split into good and bad, desirable and undesirable. Between men and women, certain features are considered masculine and feminine and favor one gender over the other. This is called sexual dimorphism. For instance, more rounded eyes indicate youthfulness and are more desirable on women than men. As such, larger eyes have greater scleral show. In this drawing, the subject has rounded eyes with scleral show, but still looks conventionally pretty. Put the exact same features on a guy and it just doesn't work. I just really don't like Aziz I'm sorry and everything he stands for. On the other hand, Louis Tomlinson has similar eye features as Tom Cruise and is considered attractive by 16 year old teenage girls everywhere. Likewise, Sendhil Ramamurthy, a sound Indian American actor, has the same masculine features of wider, deep set eyes and a prominent brow bone, leading him to being the poster child of attractive South Indian guys everywhere. He also has darker eyes which are in harmony with his complexion and so I disagree that having coloured eyes are a desirable feature, or at least place their importance very low. To finish up, scientists aren't conducting these studies to make men and women feel bad about not having the desirable features to be considered attractive. So far we know that identifying facial beauty and harmony occupies 6 points of our temporal lobe. That's precious real estate. If you're swiping on Tinder, research suggests that it takes you less than 3 seconds to decide if the person is attractive or not. A separate meta-analysis of our most recent studies by Syracuse University puts a number at a fifth of a second to fall in love. Our brain knows all of these things subconsciously because it's in our biological imperative to choose the best looking partner. This series is all about putting what we already know into words, aka defining beauty. <laughs>